And, you know, Dan did a lovely intro. That's pretty much the story. That's it. So we're done now. Um, but I initially, um, I'll just give you a quick run through of kind of my background and where I come from and what kind of inspired me to not only attend school here at LAC, but also um, to start Tree Street and kind of how those pieces merge together. Because um, it, was, it was a really, really significant part of my story. I was born and raised in Bangor Brewer area of Maine. Um, grew up there, pretty to me, typical, you know, life. Was really good at school. Sometimes liked it, sometimes didn't. Was kind of president of everything my senior year. Was captain of this field hockey team. Thank you very much. I know field hockey. Yes. Uh -huh. There's at least one person that always thinks I used But during, you know, kind of those years, it was, you know, you always, you're going off to college somewhere. That was something like my parents, my parents didn't go to college. Um, they started their own business and were very successful at being self-employed. Um, they're artists. And so for my entire life, I was on the road, like kind of schlopping pottery um, at people, you know, like those perfect gifts like your grandma really loves, like the flowers and candles and all that. That was us. Um, I got really good at selling that. Like the native scents are on the bottom. Like go ahead and take a whiff and like all that. And so that was where, you know, a lot of my outside of academic education really began. Um, and that was something that I really think, you know, added to my personality and added to my experiences that I've had, um, but also was non-traditional in comparison to a lot of other students that I worked with. When I did end up choosing a college to go to, um, I applied to a bunch of different schools, but I knew I wanted to stay in Maine. And that was something that was really actually very unique. Um, to the character of the students, and that's something that in the state of Maine, we're always talking about how you know all your young people want to leave, and they you know they flee to Boston thinking they're so cool, and then they get scared to come back. It always happens. Let's be real. Um, which a lot of my class did, and then they got scared and they came back. But a lot of the students that I, because I was up in Maine, where a lot of people would go to Orono, um, and that was not something I wanted to do. I was like, I want to be, I want to go a little bit further. I want to try something. My sister had come to Bates, so I naturally did not want to go um, at all. I actually wanted to go to Bowdoin, but that didn't work out. They deferred me. I was like, what? Like, what are you talking about, a deferral? No. So I applied to Bates, early decision round two, and I got accepted. So I was like, forget you, Bowdoin. But now it's like, thank goodness that I did, because Bates and the Lewiston community in general was is so much now a part of my story and who I am that if I had gone to school anywhere else in, in, in any other city, I wouldn't do any of the things that I do now. Okay, debates, I was going to be a bio major. Anyone a science seat person? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> oh, well, good for you. I didn't quite make the cut. Um, <laughs> after, um, after Chem 107, Polish Lax, it was all over. I was like, Ooh, this is not for me. Um, and I, you know, I struggled. My first year was really difficult. I was like, I want to be a veterinarian. Everyone wanted to be a veterinarian at some point in their life. Right, Kelsey, yes. Um, Kelsey's one of my staff members, as is Prosper, and Mark is one of my board members. Um, just to introduce them. But I, you know, I came in, I started taking all these science classes. My sister actually went to Bates as well. She was a biochem major, very successful at it as a doctor now, good for her. Not so good for me. It was really rough. She was the one advising me, so I'm taking all this horribleness, and it was just, it was ridiculous. And I was not very successful at it. And when I realized that, I was like, okay, I gotta find something I really love. And that, you know, that's part of like college in general is like, you know, you start to get more in depth in subjects and choose a, choose a, you know, subject and um, a major that really matters and that you're passionate about. And I was not feeling that about anything I was doing at that point until my sophomore year I signed up for an education course. Um, and at Bates, the way their education um, courses go is no matter which level courses, whether they're 100 level, 300 level, whatever, you have to do 30 hours of placement somewhere in the community, which was really, really intriguing to me, and that was part of the reason why I signed up for it. So I got placed at Lewiston Middle School ELL classroom. ELL, anyone know what that means? English language learners. Um, but I had no idea what that meant. You know, here I am, like 19, and like, yay, college, and yay, ELL, I don't know what that means. Okay, I'll show up. So I waltzed into room 119 of Lewiston Middle School, 
um, on my first day, having no clue what I was getting myself into, and walked into a classroom of just these remarkable kids from literally all over the world who looked absolutely nothing like me and were speaking in languages I had never even heard of before. And it was just like the coolest thing ever to me. And I was also like, how did this exist? And I had no idea. It is literally across the street. And that was something that was very powerful to me. Was, you know, in Lewiston, the community is so diverse and so different. And you can literally walk across the street and be standing in a different world than you were 30 seconds before. And that was something really, really powerful to me. I think I got my 30 hours done in like two weeks or something because I just kept going back and back and back and you know I became uh, my last name sleeper. Imagine that in a school, Miss Sleeper, Miss Sleepy sleeps a lot, man. Among other things that middle school creative minds can come up with, highly inappropriate at times. Um, but that became this new identity of mine, and it was just amazing. You know, it was really. It was, it was just so different from anything I ever knew. I honestly, you know, growing up in Bangor and Brewer, like, we didn't have people who spoke different languages. It, you just didn't. It just didn't exist. And so you only know what you know what you know. And I didn't know anything. And I realized that kind of in those moments. And I wanted to learn more, which led me to really expanding out and becoming more and more involved in the community through initially the schools and then Trinity Jubilee Center. Some of you guys know Camp Minari. Um, and that was an amazing, you know, experience for me to work with families at the soup kitchen, through a food pantry, and as the demographics, keep in mind, like this was when I was in school there, it was around 2004, 2005, when the second really large influx of um, Somali families really started moving into the area, and the demographics in the downtown area were changing so dramatically. Um, and that's where, when I started my work with Trinity, we had the idea of, well, actually, the parents had the idea. They'd come to us and say, you know, you speak English. You're nice to us. We understand, like, you can break things down. Could you help our kids understand better? And so we started targeting 10 kids. OK, so that's like you. <laughs> like this group right here, 10. That was all we were going to target. We even had printed out, I remember this. We printed out, like, you know, those graded readers, like AAA and AA and all that. Yeah, that lasted like 30 seconds because then all of a sudden everyone was bringing their brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews and nieces and before the end, before we knew it, we kind of accidentally created an after school program uh, where we started realizing like, yes, these students need help on reading, but they're also failing their classes because they're not getting homework done. But there's absolutely no one to help them on their homework. And if, if there literally wasn't a person there to support them, it wasn't going to get done. Or if it was getting done, it was getting done incorrectly. And it was kind of like kids were trying to help each other, and it just it really wasn't being effective. And so that's when we really evolved and developed it into a full-blown after-school program. We were there for, or I ran that program for five years. By the time we transplanted um, to what is currently Tree Street Youth, we were seeing 60 to 80 kids a day through that center, which some of you have probably been there, but those of you that haven't, it's pretty much the size of this room. So there's like, I don't know, like 25 of us maybe in here right now. So like triple that. And that was like on the daily. Not to mention you're hyper and you're little and, you know, enthusiastic about life and running around and want to play and there's no room to play. And it was just like amazing. But one thing I always, that was situated, uh, the Jubilee Center is situated right across from Kennedy Park, which is obviously like the big, big park right in downtown, kind of the central hub where people come together and cross paths and all of that. And that was something that was very significant to me because every day I'd stand on the edge of the park and I'd have all these amazing kids coming in to do homework. So if a kid's coming in and doing homework, and their parents aren't really making them do it, they're, they're doing pretty good. Like they're opting in, they want to be a part of it. But it was all the kids that were in the park that were actually the ones that I was concerned about because they're the ones getting into fights or not doing their homework or leaving their, you know, their homework out there on, you know, in the park while they play basketball or, you know, a lot, of, a lot of negativity was taking place. And that was something I was like, how do I engage these kids, you know, beyond just providing homework help? Because that obviously wasn't a need that they had or didn't feel that they had. And so when we finally got to the point um, of thinking kind of beyond this and really outgrowing our space, I mean, that was probably a couple of years before that that we out, actually outgrew. But we started thinking about, you know, okay, summer camps. What do all these kids do in summer camp? 
You know, Lewis and a little like trivia or data here that's kind of interesting is according to the last census, Lewis and Auburn, the municipality, but in particular Lewiston, is the only municipality that got younger. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? So in Maine, that's a very, very aging state. Like that means we have far more young people here that are drawing that, you know, average age down and significantly down. And that's something that's part of like this investment and this awareness and kind of really supporting Lewiston and the importance I feel of a school like LAC is the fact that you have so many young people here. But not only just young people that just were you know, born and raised here, but for people that have come from elsewhere who this is now their home. And that's a really, really exciting sort of thing. But it was also something that it can be your absolute greatest, you know, economic benefit and social benefit, or it could actually be the bane of your existence. Because these are also very at-risk kids and families, and if they're not supported, then they could also become a liability. And so that's something that when we are initially, kids would sign up for summer camps, right? And everyone remember, maybe people remember TOPS programming, funding, there were like scholarships for kids. And so we used to outsource, it was like the best thing ever. You help them fill out the paper and then boom, they're like, sh you're shipping them all over every program in the entire city. It was very exciting, they loved it, it was awesome. But as that program dwindled and they were no longer doing that, and we're sitting there like, oh crap. <laughs> Let's be real, what are you going to do with the hundreds of kids we used to like send everywhere? And that's why we started a summer camp. Initially when we started, we just planned on doing a summer camp. We found the old St. Castle building, 144 Howe Street. It was, it was honestly, I had it in my phone for like probably about a year as want this. It's still in my phone as want this. Like when our old landlord like used to call me, it would pop up as want this. Um, then when he used to call me, I was like, I don't know if I want this anymore. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, anyways, but he allowed us to come in for two months, and that was it. We came in and we took over the space. It was completely empty when we first got in there, which was really kind of cool when you think about it now. And all we did was we put word out to the community. LAC probably provided us pretty much majority of our furniture and chairs and tables and everything that we had for at least the first like entire summer, if not first year of programming which was so cool, it was just stuff you know they weren't using anymore. Those tablet chairs, I'll never forget my co-founder, Kim, she was like, let's take them, let's take them. You guys know what a tablet chair is? The little one with the little fold-up desk. Most horrible thing ever for an elementary school child. They get like mangled in them, and they get stuck or they shut it on themselves. It's kind of actually funny <laughs> um, at times, but like we had so many tablet chairs, they just were everywhere in the building. And eventually we slowly dissipated them like out into the community. So pretty much every home in downtown now has an LAC tablet chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty much guaranteed um, as we slowly evolve. But it was like this awesome thing to see people in the community just outpouring of support. People were ready for it. It was like everyone wanted to connect to the kids and everyone knew all these kids existed, but there was no avenue to do it. And that's what Tree Street kind of emerged as. Um, we got through our first summer camp. I don't even know how we did it. We served 80 elementary kids. We had eight street leaders. So street leaders are responsible high school youth from the community who we actually hire on to work with us as mentors and role models for the younger kids. And they literally ran summer camp the first summer. We had a couple of other college students that were there as interns, and they helped run the classes. And these, these four interns and eight street leaders and myself, I, don't even, I can't even imagine it now. Like, it's actually scary to think about like, how we got through those early years. It was pure journal. I'm here just running. Um, I remember the very first day we had made up individualized, this is so hilarious now, individualized schedules for every single child attending program in which classes they were going to go to. Kim and I spent like overnight in the building until like 5 a.m. like printing them and sorting them and then the first day it completely bombed and we threw it completely out. I remember like wiping them off the table and just be like okay this isn't going to work let's come up with a different idea. But that was like that was the beginning that was what was so cool about it. It just started and you know my my lovely board chair Betty Robinson was actually um, well sort of a semi-retired, she keeps attempting to come back and they keep saying no and then she comes back again and then they let her and um, but Betty, who is our board chair now, um, you know, she she always just kind of encouraged it was like, eh, 
well, just keep going with it. Just, you know, keep going. And like, you know, but that was the idea and the things that I had learned through both her class and other classes in the leadership program was, you know, if it doesn't work, scratch it and start over, do it over again. Like, you know, what's the point of just hammering away at something if you already know it's not gonna work? And that was a really pivotal time for me because I was going through the master's program at that time. Um, and I was learning a lot. I actually, I related to group therapy in some ways. Like, I was like, kind of had all these ideas going, you know, I was still working and doing all this stuff. And I'd come in and I'd be like, okay guys, well, what about this one? I don't know how to do this. So what do I do, you know, with this? And you know, within that group, you had so much expertise of people from people who were working at banks or working at other universities or working at this university or coming from like, you know, running their own business and going back to school. And it was such a cool, unique, diverse group of people with like these different experiences that when I threw out like a problem like this, where it's like, I don't know what to do now, or how do I, you know, attempt this or you know, this like social thing going on in the community is really impacting what kids were saying or, you know, the emotions of the kids. It was just this awesome like give take that everyone really had in the classroom. And it was very powerful for me. Um, the summer we started Tree Street was when I finished my master's. It was a little crazy, a little nutty at the time. Um, and I, I really don't know how I did it at this point. Again, adrenaline years running with it. Um, but it was really, you know, pivotal time to be able to like, you know, talk about these things and see the dynamics and like Lewis and Auburn is the coolest place ever. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit of a fan, just throwing it out there. Like I stuck around, I never went anywhere. I will ne I'll never go back home. Don't tell me. Just, my mother, she keeps helping. She thinks it's a phase, it's not. Um, but if you see her, just you know, encourage her along. Um, but you know, it's one of those things that I, you know, I fell in love with this city. And a lot of it was, you know, it, you know, through my time of integrating into the community at base, but when I got to know, like, the community, like, adults, peers, like, people, like, it was kind of like I officially made that crossover into be, being, like, a guest to being, like, a resident here. And that was something really powerful that I feel like LAC brought to me also was you know this peer network and now the connections that I had, Tree Street wouldn't have existed if I didn't have, you know, the support of Betty or, you know, Christine there like being like, do this or, you know, like and volunteers getting sent, you know, but people who really invested in it. That was what was so cool about it. And that's like kind of the story of Tree Street is it started you know, as an idea, it was a dream. It was something, you know, I wanted to do because I saw a need and I liked the kids and they were really cool and I thought they deserved a place to hang out in. It really was actually that simple. And I was like, hey Kim, you wanna start a summer camp? She goes, yep. And then we did it, you know? And, but that would not have been possible without the type of community and without the support of the colleges and, and the neighborhoods and the volunteers and just people willing to be like, hey, I have some leftover paint. Here you go. And we're like, awesome, that'll match the office. Like, you know, like sort of thing. And it's really, you know, evolved over time. So here, fast forward to today. Um, and we now currently serve about 120 to 150 youth a day, grades K through 12. It's insane. Um, ask them, look at the intern spaces right now. <laughs> yeah. They just started working for me about a month ago, so yes, it's insane. Fair enough assessment? Yes. <laughs> but awesome at the same time. And there's so much progress and there's so much like enthusiasm around it that you know we've really gotten to a point where this past summer we actually purchased our whole building facility, which is we literally doubled our space. And um, just the other day, literally, we got access to the other side like two days ago, and I was able to bring my whole staff to the other side. And it's like, I mean, imagine this room, but like three times. And like, that's like just the other side, not including our own piece of the building. And so it's like, it's again, you're feeling that vibe like you did at the beginning, like the potential is like huge, literally huge, like, which is so exciting. But it gives us so much more option and opportunity to really work with the students and help the youth um, in whatever they need. That's kind of a really exciting part of Tree Street is you meet them where they're at. It's also a very challenging part when you're working there as a volunteer or a board member. You know, we're literally creating this from scratch. 
And though we have ideas, like the idea of a street leader like I brought from another program, or the framework of an intern program, like we've evolved that, but the ideas like came from elsewhere where I saw them working. But like it's it's created from the kids. It's from the community. It's someone coming and saying, hey, I have this idea. What about this? Or could this work? Or, you know, what about setting it up like this? The kids literally, like, the seventh graders, like, hijacked a couch the other day, like, from the middle school, the elementary kids' room. It was the funniest thing ever. Like, the four, fifth, and sixth graders were like, doo doo doo. And then all of a sudden, like, all these seventh graders come in and, like, take their couch. And, like, they're like, we're going to borrow this and, like, bring it to their room. And they were like, it's more effective this way. This is better for us, you know, sort of thing. But it, like, you know, as, as chaotic as it was in the moment, and, of course, the fifth graders are like, no, our couch. That's the only thing that makes us look cool. Like, you know, um, as they were, like, going through that, it actually made sense to us. And, like, you know, and the kids, like, cre taking ownership of the space and maintaining the space and cleaning the space, including the toilets, you know, like, it's really, like, powerful to see, like, when you give, like, students an opportunity to do something, like, how far they'll run with it. And that's really, like, what Tree Street has emerged as. And now, here we are four years later, about 65% of the students that we serve currently um, are students from different immigrant or refugee backgrounds. Um, of those 65%, about 57%, you like this, I got new stats, I got this cool little tracker thing now, we can keep track of everything, very cool, okay, no one's excited about that, I was excited, but about 57% of the kids that we serve are Somali, um, and then the remaining 35% um, of the students that we serve are typically born and raised right here in Lewiston, or have moved from elsewhere, but live primarily right in that downtown Lewiston area. But even we, even this summer we've expanded, we had a student coming all the way from Jay to access the summer program, um, who was part of the foster system, and it just kind of like, it worked for them, and worked for their family. And so that was something that was really, you know, exciting with the expansion of the building, and just all the potential that's going on here, for like, you know, it's just, it's just ridden with potential. And these kids are like so excited about everything. They bring us new ideas every day, along with all their drama and all their everything else that you really just don't even want to hear anymore about, but you're gonna, um, whether you want to hear it or not. And it's really just an amazing experience to be a part of it and a, and a privilege. And the people that we've you know, drawn in you know, from our interns, who literally, we have interns from all over the world. Prosper, I'm gonna pick on you. Where are you from? Rwanda. Rwanda. Kelsey, where are you from? Prescott, <laughs> woo, you know, like you know, but like they're they're coupled with um, a gentleman who's an intern of ours from Sudan, who but who has grown up in Lewiston here for most of his life, you know, and then Fabi, who's all the way from California, you know, and his family is originally from El Salvador, but she was born and raised here, you know, and that's just our interns this year. We've developed this intern program where they they live together on Bartlett Street, two blocks up from the center like, you know, in the heart of downtown, have all, you know, the same experiences and go through things, you know, the same as all the families do, living in downtown, but also working there, really integrating themselves, like, into the experience. And that is so powerful for kids and families to see. You know, volunteers are, again, we couldn't have started the center without volunteers, but we found that we needed this consistency, this support for the students, and that's where the internship program emerged. And it's kind of like ideas like that are kind of always evolving and flowing out of it. We're open, just to throw out some logistics, and then we'll close with some questions, but we're open five days a week, Monday through Thursdays from 2 to 6, Fridays from 2 to 4. It's a shorter day. It's like, eat in, do your homework, be bye. Um, which they never leave. They never leave. Like, you're like literally like herding them out the door, and then someone swoops around. It's like a great time. Um, it's like, you know, that's a compliment. They love it, they want to be there. Um, but it's really, you know, the program has evolved over time. We now have an arts and cultural um, program uh, director, which is brand new. Megan, who's been with us for years, has now evolved those programs. We have, we have drawing classes and painting classes and guitar lessons and piano lessons and singing and dance of various types, Zumba. Those are crazy. Anyone do Zumba? Be honest. Okay, well, I do so much. Um, I love it. 
Um, it's a great time, like, you know, but then to the sports and the basketball, and we're starting Ultimate Frisbee this week. Weird. But anyone Ultimate Frisbee? No, definitely not. Okay. Um, but those are, like, you know, experiences for kids that they otherwise may not have the opportunity to take a fine arts class or a photography class or, or learn to play the guitar because so many of our kids come, every single one of our kid, kids right now are free reduced lunch. So, and that's kind of the marker we use for where they are, like kind of on a socioeconomic um, level, which means they get lunch at school and breakfast at school because their families can't afford to send it with them. And so that, that just kind of is a good demonstrator of like the degree of like of poverty and at risk like, you know, levels these a lot of our students are at. Um, I'd like to close with just the name, Tree Street and kind of that story and where that emerged from. When we were trying to name it, it was actually really funny. I was with a colleague of mine, um, and we're sitting out in front of the building, right? And I don't know if anyone's really ever like looked at our building. It's kind of just ridiculous and dilapidated and kind of funny looking, but we own it. Yeah. Okay, I'm the only one inside. But, you know, we're like sitting there, we're, like this big, massive, white, boom-like thing doesn't exactly exude anything excited imagery or anything or youthfulness at all. And, you know, we're sitting there, we're like, okay, how street? We're like, no, we don't want to lock ourselves in the location. What if we become huge and move and, you know, build something up the block or whatever? And then we're like, Birch Street. And we're like, no, again, location. And then I was like, oh my gosh, the tree streets. And like that was a term I had heard over the years just from being around. And it was actually a term that, you know, the first time I had heard it was when I initially came to college in the city. Part of my first year orientation was if you find yourself on a tree street, turn around. I know, it's laughable, right? At the time, though, it really wasn't. Like, they were dead serious about that. And I remember, like, you know, being confused by that because once I started meeting kids and going downtown and working with a lot of the students, I was like, wait, I, I missed something. Like, you know, or this is an extreme misperception. And so that was something that, you know, when we named the center, we wanted it to be like, okay, when people are thinking of tree streets, we want them to think of like these awesome kids and these families and everything positive going on in this environment and kind of take back that term, you know, the idea of like taking back a term, like, and really like rename that. And, you know, and I'm happy, you know, to report that not only just the work we're doing, but the work LAC has done and the work like the other colleges have done and just the community in general of like revitalizing like, you know, downtown and just the awareness of bringing to it is working. Like these kids have so much pride, like Tree Street and even like this, I'll, I'll do this, you know, God Love Bates, that was my orientation. That was 10 years ago, right? Today, every single first year did a walking, like, walk around of downtown as part of their orientation this year. How cool is that? You know, and they're meeting people and they're integrating with, you know, LAC students and CMCC students and just everyone is really coming together. And where we see that a lot is at the center. The last piece of our mission um, is creating unity across lines of difference. Like, that is real and that is really necessary. Like, you know, Lewis and Auburn is an amazing place, but it's also one that's, you know, ridden with the same histories and difficulties that, you know, pretty much every American city that's had different types of integration and different cultures marching together have faced. And that's something that at the center, but also beyond, like, even with our interns, our interns come from all these different backgrounds, but they are like a microcosm of the world to try and demonstrate, like, learning from one another can be really powerful. And it can be really challenging. And then they take themselves and put them in Tree Street, where we have all these kids from all these different backgrounds that are challenged by that whole integrative piece and supporting one another and learning about one another. And then they go out further into the community of Lewiston, and then they work on those issues together and demonstrate it. And like even just here in this room, you know, and then beyond. And that's a powerful, powerful component that we see ourselves like not only playing a role in, but being a leader in, because we're really teaching those messages to the students 
and pushing them with that. So by the time they do end up coming to college, like they're bringing and they're confident in those things to bring that into the classroom and challenge you know beliefs and perceptions and ideals. And that's something that you know I'm proud to say as a student or a master student here, like that was what we talked about. Like that that is what needs to be talked about. And even though it was you know we had people from all different backgrounds in the class, and at times different people had different levels of knowledge or experience or you know it, it was talked about. And that's what made it like such a benefit for someone like me coming in being like, I don't know how to handle this. But if you can't tackle all these other subjects or be willing to discuss them or even be willing to say, I don't understand, like it was a safe space in order to do that. And I think that was a powerful experience, you know, that I had being a student here and also a student just of Lewiston and Auburn. Like that was really powerful. So with that, I'm going to go to questions. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Good segue. I don't think you talked about college prep program. Oh, thank you. Wonderful board member as he is. Um, sometimes you get so close to a project you forget like the things you've said and not said. So thank you, Mark. So one of the pieces um, that is a really vital component of Tree Street is the college prep program. And so what we do is we work with students, mainly seniors and their families, to support them through that you know that final year of high school and onward and making those decisions. Um, last year we worked with 32 um, seniors, which was amazing. We started with eight the very first academic year, and now we're up to 32. This year it's hovering around the same number, potentially up to a little bit more than that. Um, and you just walk with them through that whole process. A lot of students will be like, okay, go fill out the common application, and they're like, okay. What's a common application? You know, and so a lot of the students, you know, with with not having parents or family members who have gone through this, they really are first generation. And so we really push them and walk with them through that and help them fill out the common application. I say from application to moving day, quite literally. Um, we move them sometimes, which is really fun. Um, we we last year or two years ago, we moved four boys to Farmington. I think we had an entourage of like three or four vans. Like we just like caravans there. It was pretty awesome. Um, we took a picture of everyone. It was like it must have been like 25 people or something. Like the whole campus was like, what is going on? Because um, it was like so exciting. It was everyone wanted to come see and witness. Um, and I'm happy to report that of those 32 seniors last year, 24 of them got accepted into four-year colleges. Um, which and then the rest of them, the the remaining eight, um, not a math. Yeah, that was pretty <laughs> um, the remaining eight, you know, either decided to stay and go to community college locally or have entered the workforce or a couple of them have ventured off and moved to different places with their families and are attending college in, in other places and other states now. Um, and it really is like just this amazing, you know, opportunity to kind of reach that finish line with them, but they're never really finished. You know, and then to see like the Facebook posts and the comments and them calling us, they're talking back in. And they're like, they're like the heroes. When they walk back into Pro and it's like, oh my gosh, MK's home. Like, Kuso's here, you know, like sort of thing. Because they they really are the trailblazers. And it almost gives you goosebumps to think about like just how much they they've strived and they've overcome and challenged themselves. And with, you know, another interesting statistic is <laughs> In downtown, the number of bachelor degrees that exist is not even significant enough to assign a number. And to be sending that number of kids who live in those areas off to achieve just that, or even stay close and achieve just that, like down the block from their house, is so powerful. And that's really like, you know, anyone who's about higher education, that's that's what it's about. You know, and how powerful is that gonna be to progress the community and to have them come back and they're working as interns. We've had students who have grown up through the program come back and be interns, you know, at the center. And to be able to like put them in the same boat as, you know, Kelsey who graduated from Colby, you know, sort of thing. And they're they're on those same levels and they're coming together from all over the world with people and seeing like the power that they really have. That's so cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And so, um, thank you, Mark, for bringing that up. But college prep is oh, thank you. Um, college prep is a huge component of our program, um, and LEC again has been a huge part of that. We do multiple tours here every single year, and it's always one of the favorites. And it opens up their eyes, especially when they go get to go to like the nursing wing 
and they like to play with like, body body things. Um, but like that's really powerful, and, and it's a viable option for kids to stay home or close by and attend a legitimate, powerful four-year college and still have that college experience. And it's just down the street, and they can see it, and they can access it, and they can know people and recognize them, and get recognized. Like that's really you know really powerful. All right, so with all that, any other questions? All right, anything. When I when I speak, I always say anything goes. So yes, sir, our choice. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank you for coming here. You know, I've heard poetry street. You obviously working here, but I honestly had no idea the scope of what you folks do. That's really impressive. Thank you. And you said a lot of great stuff. But one of the things that really stood out to me was the fact how you started. You saw a need. I, I just think that's a life lesson for everyone that you know spend a lot of time identifying needs but not yeah. taking that next initiative to do something about it. So I just applaud you and all yeah. the work. Well, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. What's the hardest thing you have to do as a leader in your role? Well, besides dealing with knuckleheads, no, I'm, like, I'm just kidding. I love them. They're my absolute favorite. Give, give me like the most outrageous child and they, I will love them to death. Um, beyond just the physical exhaustion of like, you know, working with so many lives, um, I think that the most difficult aspect of it is I compare it, at least, and this is for my role as being like an executive for a founder and all this. But also being at kind of this critical point where I'm still at program every single day. Like I'm still there on the ground working with kids. Parents are texting, this is the Tree Street phone. Right here, this bad boy. It's a slide one, pretty impressive. Um, but you know, like still being like very young and grassrootsy, and I probably wouldn't change it for anything. But I compare it to like holding jello, kind of. It's like it starts to squirm and I gotta catch this and then this happens and then this happens and this happens. And then the dynamics of the community, you guys are you guys are here, like even even what's going on, like when something out there happens and then the impact that it has on your students or the community at large, it like unexpected things. I mean our block even in the last week has been like just insane. You know, the amount of things that have gone down. And like those are uncontrollable. So it's kind of like catching the uncontrollable things and then adapting to it and working the kids through those experiences and the staff through it and the board through it and really just in the community through it. But ultimately, that, that is the point, you know? Um, but being able to be prepared for the un things you're not prepared for, I think are, is probably the hardest thing. Not to mention money, I mean money's always, you know, but. How do you find, like, I find, I have a really strong sense of passion for community engagement. You and I have had this conversation before. Yeah. And how do you keep your emotions in check when I'm sure you have a strong sense of, like, powerful defense mechanism for your kids? Because like, you have a lot of kids to be, to advocate for. How do you keep a, a balance in advocating for them and being too defensive for them? Yeah. Um, well, I teach all my staff, like, if you don't see me crying at some point, you probably don't know me well enough. Um, no, you, you be real. You know, you be real about it. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the powerful components of Tree Street is, like, if you're having a rough day, go ahead. Have it. Let it out. Do whatever. And that's for the kids and staff or me or anyone else. But when you, when you create that type of environment where things like we're going to tell it like it is and we're going to say it like it is but we're going to do it in a tactful powerful way you know being upset about like there's so many random things that you can get frustrated about like you know but the reality is if your frustration begins to paralyze you you're not doing anything or if you're teaching that kid like yeah oh that's so unfair i can't believe that happened to you or that teacher did this or what is that doing for them it's kind of like you know teaching them and ourselves because it, it's come over time. It's an evolution thing, and even in certain days, like but we check each other on that. Like the staff will check me if I'm getting too like it's like you can't control that. What are you gonna do? You know, sort of thing. 
and it's kind of learning to balance that, like what is in your control and what is a battle to fight, and then what is not in your control and what is the kid's battle to fight. You know, because ultimately when you look down the line, it's like, you know, a lot of the, the challenges or the injustices that they're experiencing or the institutionalized, like, prejudice or issues aren't going to change with me going up and saying, hey, this is wrong. Like, they're like, okay, so what? Who are you? Why does it matter? You know, sort of thing. But where it can change is if the kids say something about it or the kids notice it or realize, like, wow, but I really want to be taken seriously, so if I, I need to get my education, or I need to like go and talk about this with these people, or like you know create a change. You know when you get frustrated, it, it most of the time it just paralyzes you, and and that's something that you know you really have had to learn over time. Um, but if you you know run full speed, you know swords pulled, like you know flaming arrows, like every single time you probably won't achieve anything because there's too many battles to fight. You, you're working with kids and families, like their lives are messy. And you're working with at-risk and low-income kids and kids of multicultural backgrounds and with language difficulties and, you know, just domestic stuff going on and drug use and blah, 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 blah. blah. Like, it just keeps going. Like, if you fixate on all the negative, like, there's no way, you know, you'll ever tackle any of that, even for one kid. <coughs> like so it's kind of like focusing on like what you are in control of and what you can do you know is really that's the way we've been able to forge ahead so otherwise it will paralyze you and then you're not up to anyone anything else yes sir i just want to comment on, on your attitude and i think it's so critically critically important that seeing all the potential that the communities have and all the potential each individual has Absolutely. is the way the door opens and the door closes. And I think that's, I get really frustrated with people who have lived here a long time and only can kind of see why the glass is half empty and still half full. So uh, I think it's very important, you know, in some parts of the old line, but I'll see it when I believe it. And, and I'll believe it when I see it. I think it's just the other way around. Maybe it's not seeing what you well, and that's something, you know, when we started Tree Street, like a lot of people like ask about the parents. Well, what are the parents doing? Because our program is at no cost to families, literally no cost to families. And it will remain that way. You know, and a lot of people like have feelings about that. Well, you know, what if these types of families start to come and they can pay or, you know, like this or that or, well, aren't you just then handing it to them and they're not. But the reality is, is like, no, those kids are working for this. They're behaving themselves. They're they're learning. They're getting their homework done. They're cleaning up. They're you know doing a little fundraiser on their own. They're you know doing these types of things. Parents come in, and I have some parents. My favorites are the moms that sit out front. We have like this little like wooden bench fence thing. I don't know, it's just a thing. But anyways, all the moms like majority of our our, our you know daily moms like can't speak English or they have very very little. So, you know, on the outside, the perception of what can they contribute, they can't tutor, they can't read to kids, they can't run a, you know, a program, they can't keep notes on things, they can't write a grant, you know, like, people could look at it as they can't do any of these things, but you know what these moms can do? They can yell at kids, <laughs> and they're really good at it, because they have a lot of kids, and so they know how and who's what and what's a proper behavior, and they sit right out there on the bench, and sit there and be like, oh, like, you know, don't take that ball from them. You know, oh, I got the ball, don't go and get it. You know, like, funniest, like, ever in my mind. Like, this mom the other day, like, came up and she, like, kicked the soccer ball, like, what, full hijab, like, kicked the soccer ball, like, back into the court. It was, like, so proud of herself. She's like, I did it. And, like, you know, and it's like, that's what she can contribute, you know, and, and that's powerful. And they get the kids there. Absolutely. That's their relationship. Get the kids there. And then trust them also, even taking that step further, like with the college program, a lot of these moms, like, they don't they don't know exactly what college is like. Like we can bring them here, we can show them, but like when your kid moves off to college or is even going to class, like a lot the context is just not even present for at least our, a lot of our immigrant refugee parents, but even a lot of our, you know. American born parents, it's just not in the context. They, there isn't that understanding, they've never experienced it. You can't expect them to understand it. But like trusting that kid 
or trusting us to be like, no, this is a good thing, like, it's going to be good. You know, that's a powerful thing in, in how, I mean, like, so you sent your daughter off to college. Like, how difficult is that? You trust them, that you raised them, and you, you know, did everything you could, and there you go. And that the world is going to take care of them. But no, like, they're going to take care of the world. Like, that's powerful. And I'll never forget, one of the first kids we ever sent off to college, he came back, and you know how, like, first freshmen, or rather college students in general, like, eat a lot of, like, oodles of noodles? Like, or what are the ramen noodles? Yeah, everyone, right? It's just like a thing. Really bad for the sodium, but whatever. Um, tell me why this mom, like, sends him back on his way with this giant box of, like, cup of noodles. Like, she, I don't know, she did a BJ's or something, but, like, she, like, was like, wait, wait, Julie. And, like, came and handed me this massive thing. And it was the funniest thing ever because this mom has, like, never even seen the school before. But she knew as a mom, when their child was returning to school, that they needed lots of cup of noodles. And like, and that was what she could contribute to it. It was like, here you go. I can't feed him when he's there, but I heard this is cool. And this is what you're supposed to eat when you go to college. But you know, and like little things like that, they sound silly, but like, that's a learning curve. Like that is just an accomplishment. Like, and an awareness, and a hearing your child, listening to them. Like, how many times do we just wish parents would like just listen to their kids and have that type of communication, even down to like what the cool thing is to eat when you go to college? Like, and then be like, okay, that doesn't make sense to me, but here you go. You know, it was just awesome. Um, maybe it's time for like one last question if someone has it, or we can just conclude. All right. Well, I want to thank, thank you, you for coming in. Yeah.